Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. And this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Happy Monday. Happy Monday, Beth. How are things? Um, things are great. School is ending or has ended by the time this comes out yeah. for us. I don't know about you guys, but no, we have this week. Okay. All this week. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a half day on Thursday, and which is now when we were recording, right. but <laughs> no school Friday for you guys. You didn't. Nope. Know. Yep. School's over. So, so it's start the summer vacation people. We go away and we start traveling like crazy now. I know. Same. Christy and I have been working so furiously at the summer schedule that it's making our brains hurt. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. It's that's like... a lot. We have recorded. So this week we will have recorded one, two, three, four, four episodes. No, five. Oh, yeah, yeah. Five episodes in one week, mm-hmm. which is a lot for us. <laughs> it, is. So it is. It is. We've been having to keep a lot of information in our... Yeah, I don't have brain muscle space for hardly anything else. Well, yeah, right, exactly. Um, so, so my, so today is Thursday that we're recording. My kids had EOGs today. Oh, so I've been up since six o'clock because my self promised my kids donuts. You're too nice. Is, I know. I was the only person there at six ten this morning. <laughs> I bet you were. Big litter. And they wanted like bacon and eggs. And so then I came home and cooked all that. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Gosh, man. My kids are like, can I have pancake? I'm like, I don't got time. Well, it's EOG day. <laughs> I don't do this normally. Normally, no, I'm like, I know. a pop tart, toaster, yeah. or not. <laughs> yeah, true. And true. throw some fruit at them. True. Anyway, yeah. <sighs> so what else? I don't have, have, I was going to say, I don't have time to make my kids breakfast, but I have time to go and get my Polar Pop every morning. Yes. Okay. The Polar Pop. Please educate them because I have to tell you, I did not know what a Polar Pop was until you. Well, so if you have Circle K, which they're everywhere, they're all over the U.S., they have Sip and Save. And when I first started, Sip and Save was five ninety nine, and for the month, you got one fountain drink. Anything that you can like dispense by yourself, essentially. A day, so, right? Yeah, a day. And so I always get this extra large Coke Zero. And I don't go every day, but it's a good amount of the time that I go. Yeah. And so my husband made fun of me when I first started doing it because he was like, you have a subscription for soda. Like literally every yeah. month you pay $6 and get, and I'm like, but I get a soda every day. I don't have to keep it in the house. <laughs> well, that's true. And you know, <laughs> the thing is, there is nothing like a fountain soda. Nothing like it. Oh yeah, no. And if That's you say my... that it doesn't make a difference, then you're, you're yeah wrong. You are just right. you're lying to yourself. Yeah, they are good. Fountain sodas are good. And I saw this person on TikTok talking or something. I don't know what I saw her on. She was talking about how as we get older, our requirements for friends, you know, our circle of friends gets smaller, and our requirements for what we want in a friend change and she was like and one thing that I absolutely have to have in a friend like if you're gonna be my friend you have to appreciate a fountain soda yeah because it's just better it is I agree it's my favorite I don't I don't get the same enjoyment out of like a can of soda if I buy them from the store I know even if I pour it out (laughs) right nope it's not the same add to that I feel like a requirement for me is that you don't show up everywhere in regular pants. Like if you don't okay. sometimes come in yoga pants, I just don't really know. Like you're showing you're showing us all up, right? Just be yeah. Happy. True. That's true. <laughs> it's true. Very true. Well, anyway, now I pay nine ninety nine. By the way, so I'm, it's oh, upped no. in price, but well, it's still worth it. Huge amount of inflation. It's still worth it. Well, I can't think of one Circle K near me. Yeah, I don't know either. I know I got it there, but it was when I was at my condo. Right. So I don't know where it is near you. Right. (laughs) Well, I'm going to look it up later. Oh, wait. No, there's one over by um, Briggs. Oh. Because I was... 
it is far, but I was there charging the Tesla that I rented, remember? <laughs> At that yeah, hotel, and I walked to the Circle K to get my Polar Bus. Actually, you were like, I like, do you want me to come and get you? Do you have to be there for a while? And you were like, no, I'm fine. I'm going to Circle K. Come, come up, go get my Polar Bus. <laughs> I remember. Anyway. <laughs> all right. Well, if that's all anybody has for today, we are we appreciate you guys. Yep. I hope your summer is great so far. And I have a case. I have to all right. I'm ready. Case, actually, surprise. Oh, okay. I'm ready. Okay. Here we go. Okay, today's episode, I am doing things a little bit differently. Oh man, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone knows we cover cases sent in by listener suggestions, right? We don't pick our cases, people write in uh, cases that they want us to know. So most of the time, the cases are small from small towns, not reported on or picked up by like big sort of national media sources for the most part. And the bad thing about that is sometimes there's not very much information out there on them, which we run into quite often. And so it's hard to make an entire episode, which bums us out because their stories still need to be told. So I somehow have found myself in a situation with a whole bunch of these small cases. So I decided I was going to put two together. For okay. one episode. So I'm going to tell you two crimes today. All right. It's a twofer. <laughs> and it's not like our normal twofers when we both do one. Not normal, yeah. but like ones that we've done in the past. Yeah. That's cool. Right. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. So they're not related in any way. The only um, similarity is that it's two teenagers. Oh, okay. So we're talking about two teenage girls. So this... These are the cases of Sydney Stevens and Carol DeLeon. Didn't we do another DeLeon, by the way? Yeah. Um, oh, my gosh. Why can't I remember her first name now? She's the one that we talked about on mm -hmm. another thing. That mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Stay tuned for that later. Um, anyway, okay. No relation, I don't think. But first, I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you about Sydney Stevens. Okay. It's the first case we're going to talk about. Okay. So this case was sent in by my older sister, Laura. Oh, hey, Laura. Hi. Who is more true crime obsessed than we are, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> and she has been like a number one supporter of our little pod for from like the beginning, day one. She, she'll like often send something on either like Facebook Messenger or even like um, Instagram will be like, you guys should look that. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. read about this. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, she's great fun. She's really, really obsessed. So, okay. <clears throat> so she sent this in and we are going to a really cute town name called Pickneyville, Illinois. Pickneyville. Pickneyville. I have passed that. Okay. Because it is 60 miles southeast of you. Yeah, I yeah. Was say I for I know that name, and the only way I would know that name is if I saw it on a sign. Yeah, Pickneyville. <laughs> it's like like probably one of my favorites. Wetumpka was my favorite. Oh well, yeah, that's a good Pickneyville. And I, and I drove through there. Remember when I was coming yes. home? I'm like, oh, I just saw a Wetumpka sign. <laughs> yeah, love it. Okay, so Pickneyville is teeny teeny tiny. The whole entire town is only four point three square miles. And it has a population of just over 5,000 people. Okay. All right. And it looks real cute. Okay. Sydney Edith Cheyenne Stevens was born May 15th of 1995 in Murfreesboro, Illinois. So this would make her a Taurus. Stable, right. hardworking. Like, have we ever talked about a Taurus before? I don't, I don't know. I'm sure we have. Uh, her parents were Jason and Tracy. They were not together, and Sydney was one of five children, but some of her siblings were half siblings. Okay. Sydney enjoyed making bracelets, listening to music, going to concerts, riding four wheelers, fishing, and camping. At the time of our case in 2010, Sydney was 15 years old mm -hmm. and attended Pickneyville Community High School. And was an active member of Oak Grove Baptist Church. 
She was a little cutie patootie. She had short brown hair, brown eyes, and she wore black rimmed glasses Mm -hmm. and had a lip ring. Okay. As Sydney grew into her teen years, she did develop some struggles in her life regarding her mental health and her emotional well-being. She had previously attempted suicide and was known to run away from home on occasion, but she always came back on her own. Sydney loved to hang around her older half-sister, Dakota Wall, which is why my sister sent this case in because Wall is our maiden name. Mm -hmm, Right. And her son's name is Dakota. (gasps) So she saw that and was like, whoa, that's interesting. Right, yeah. So the two of them had the same friends and they hung out in this like similar social circles. And so Sydney thought, you know, this is my older sister. I love her. She's so cool. I love her friends. Dakota, however, was not very fond of Sydney always being around, and she wasn't very nice to Sydney. Mm. Okay. As Sydney and Dakota got older, the rift between them grew because Dakota was resentful of the fact that Sydney was always like tagging along and around and annoying her. And this really upset Sydney and hurt her feelings because she just like loved her sister. Dakota was dating a boy named Chad Bennett, and he was the leader of a local gang there in Pickneyville that called themselves the P-Town Saints. Okay, guys. (laughs) P-Town. P-Town. P-Town Saints. (laughs) Okay. Sorry. I should not be laughing at this matter, but this – that was just – that's not – it's not a gang name. Sorry. It's not (laughs) – well, it is in Pickneyville. <laughs> okay. Sydney had also dated a member of the gang named Carl Dane, but the two of them had recently broken things off. She broke up with Carl. Okay. On July 19th, 2010, Sydney went missing. I do not know the circumstances in which her family became aware that she was no longer there. I just know that they tried to find her, couldn't get a hold of her. Her friends and family didn't know where they lived. And Sydney would go back and forth between mom's house and dad's house. And there were a lot of siblings, you know, intermingled in there. And so they didn't know where she was. Mm -hmm. At first, they thought that Sydney had just run away again because she had a history of doing that. But they were very concerned, even if she had just run away because of her mental illness, that she would harm herself. Mm -hmm. And so they immediately did report her missing. Okay. Once she was reported missing, the community immediately rallied and searches went out for Sydney, but there was no sign of her for several days. Then on July 25th, six days after Sydney was last seen, her body was found in a river underneath a bridge in Pickneyville, not far from her home. Oh, man. Two fishermen had spotted Sydney's body and immediately recognized her lip ring and a necklace that she was wearing from the missing person flyers Mm. and her photos. At first, suicide was suspected because of Sydney's history and because she was found under a bridge. Mm -hmm. However, Sydney had suffered multiple gunshot wounds that were determined to not have been self-inflicted. So her death was ruled a homicide. So police began questioning Sydney's family and friends, all of whom denied knowing or being involved in Sydney's murder. They questioned her ex-boyfriend, Carl, who was also denied having anything to do with Sydney's death. However, police obtained some of Carl's belongings and they found blood on some items of clothing that matched Sydney. Mm. So once Carl was confronted with this pretty damning evidence, he confessed that he had murdered Sydney. What? So he claimed that on July 19th, he had gone to Sydney's house and the two of them had fought. He said things got out of control and he strangled Sydney until she passed out and then took her to his car and drove her to the bridge. He then shot her and threw her over. Was she not so, dead with the strangling? He it just No. Hmm. Okay. According to him, she just passed out. So this story did line up with what they already knew, 
However, police also knew that Carl was a member of the P-Town Saints. Right. (laughs) Sorry, I made a funny motion. Mm -hmm. The gang. And so they knew that what one gang member did, they likely all did. So they suspected that Carl had not acted alone and that he was just like taking the blame. Okay. As police began questioning other members of the gang, more people started confessing to either knowledge of Sydney's murder or being a part of it. So this mm-hmm. other boy, James Glazier, admitted that he had taken part in Sydney's murder, and he told police the full story of what actually happened on the evening of July 19th. James said that he and Carl, so Carl is Sydney's ex-boyfriend, mm-hmm went to Sydney's home uninvited and they went through, they got in through an unlocked open patio door. Another member of the gang, Robbie Mueller was also with them and he stayed outside to keep watch. James and Carl attacked Sydney and choked her until she became unconscious. They then dragged her out to Carl's car and drove her to the bridge and that Carl then shot Sydney two to four times, and they dumped her body in the river. They left, and then the three boys later returned to Sydney's body to tie her to a cement block to weigh her down, which apparently didn't work because somebody found her. My so goodness. all of this, I know, all of this information was 100% corroborated by evidence found on Sydney's body, in Carl's car, in the three boys' possession. They found the gun. But what police didn't know was why in the world did these boys murder this 15-year-old girl? Right. And when they find out what actually happened and the motive, they were very shocked. Mm. Police learned that just days before Sydney was murdered, her sister, Dakota, had read her journal. And in Sydney's journal, she had written about how how she was having an intimate and sexual relationship with Dakota's gang leader boyfriend, Chad. So this not only enraged Dakota, but it also made Sydney's ex, Carl, who was also in the gang, mad. So when Dakota came up with a plan to take care of Sydney, Carl agreed to help, and then he called in his friends. Her own sister? Planned this? Police, that's exactly oh. right. Her own sister planned and orchestrated her murder hmm. because she was mad and jealous. Jeez. And who knows if they even were really having a sexual relationship? We don't know. Right. Where's this journal? I think they did find the journal and it was in there. Okay. So Dakota had even been the one to leave the back patio door open so that the boys could get inside the home, and kidnap Sydney. When questioned, Dakota claimed that she did have a part in this little plan, but that the boys were only supposed to scare Sydney to teach her a lesson not to kill her. Mm. Police also suspected that Chad, the P-Town Saints leader and Dakota's boyfriend, also had knowledge of and was involved in Sydney's murder. I mean, he's the gang's leader. And the mastermind of the plan was his boo. Right. So, like, he probably knew, too. So all five of them were arrested. Wow. So Dakota, the three gang members, and her boyfriend, the gang leader, were all arrested. Dakota was charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, home invasion, and burglary. She took a plea deal and pleaded to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 26 years in prison with parole eligibility after 10 years, and she'll be up for parole in 2028. Oh, okay. Carl Dane, Sydney's ex-boyfriend, the person who actually shot her, he was charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, home invasion, and burglary. He took a plea deal and pleaded guilty in 2011 to first-degree murder and was sentenced to 60 years in prison. The night before he was going to be transferred to his new home in federal prison, Carl was found dead from a suicide completion in his county jail cell. Oh, wow. James Glazier, the guy who helped Carl kidnap Sydney, was found guilty and sentenced to 60 years in prison. And Robbie Mueller, the man that was like the lookout, 
was found guilty and sentenced to 37 years in prison. Chad, the boyfriend gang leader, was also charged with home invasion and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Jeez. So the P-Town Saints are all ganging it up in prison. I was going to say, are there any left? I don't know. I don't know if there is. I mean, their leader is gone. So yeah. Sydney's death has been labeled, sadly, I know we hate this, but it's called the P-Town Gang Murder. Mm. Yeah. And she was killed by her own sister. I know. That's so sad. And also what's slightly concerning to me is that my own sister sent me a case about an older sister killing her younger sister. <laughs> So I'm like, Laura. Yeah. What's going anyway, on she here? was 15 years old, and it's like the grossest. It's almost like that gang mentality, right? Where one person is like, hey, we should do this. And they're all like, yeah, it's mm-hmm. sickening and scary. Yeah. No, that, mm. I, I, yeah, it worries me. That, oh, I don't understand how somebody that's like, that close to you could orchestrate. But then again, that's what happens in all of these cases. Somebody close to them is the one that is murdering them in most mm-hmm. cases. So right. it's awful, awful. And I do think that they tried to make it look like a suicide. Right, because she had already attempted it before. Right. Mm-hmm. But they just did a really crappy job. I know. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is the case of Sydney Stevens. I have another one for you, but let's take a quick break before we get into that one. Okay. The next case that we are going to talk about today is extremely interesting. And so I had to get it in here somehow because it is crazy. You saved the best for last? I did. Yes. We're going to end on a little bit of a higher note. Okay. Okay. Um, Still sad. Terribly sad murder. Okay. This was sent in by our listener, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Yes. And for today's, the second case for today, we're going to another favorite of mine, Texas. Oh, I was going to say, is it Texas? Yeah. (laughs) San Antonio, to be exact. This is the case of Carol DeLeon. Okay. Do you remember the name of that other one? No, but I stopped thinking about it. Okay. (laughs) It's okay. <laughs> Carol Joyce de Leon was born on February 18th of 1963 in the Texas. This makes her an Aquarius. Okay. I love Aquariuses. They're so optimistic. Oh, are they? They're like, yes, it's like one of the, it's a nice sign. What? I'm sorry. What, what, what month is that? I February 18th is her birthday. Okay. Carol's parents were Rodolfo and Ramona And she had a younger sister named Sandra. I'm not sure she had any other siblings, but I know she had that sister. Mm -hmm. Carol was a beautiful and charming Hispanic young lady. She had a gorgeous smile and a magnetic personality. She's really pretty. Mm. At the time of our case in 1981, Carol was 18 years old and had just graduated from Thomas Edison High School in San Antonio. Six days after her graduation on June 4th, 1981, Carol went out to a club in downtown San Antonio to celebrate the graduation with friends. Mm -hmm. At some point during the night, Carol's friends lost track of her and she was never seen again. Hmm. The next day, the body of a young Hispanic woman was found in a grassy area off the interstate near a rest like a rest area Mm -hmm. in New Braunfels, Texas, which is a few towns from San Antonio. It's like 30 miles. This woman had been shot six times in the head. Oh my gosh. She also, yeah, it's like such overkill. Mm -hmm. She also had some marks and bruising around her neck, indicating that she had been strangled or forcibly held by her neck. Jeez. Some of her clothing had been removed, but sexual assault was unclear. Evidence was taken from the body, including a rape kit and fingernail scrapings. Because the body did not have any identification on or near it, it was labeled as a Jane Doe. Oh, my gosh. So they didn't know Mm -hmm. who it was. Carol's parents and loved ones called police to report her missing. 
However, because Carol was 18 years old and had just graduated high school, a missing persons report was not filed. Mm. Police said that she was an adult and had the right to leave and start a new life, and there was no reason to suspect foul play. Because a missing persons report was never filed, police never connected that the body they had just found murdered 30 miles away the day after Carol was last seen and completely matched her description. They did not connect that it was her. So so when they say no report, they literally mean there's just like no evidence that you even called it whatsoever. Correct. I mean, that's just ridiculous. There should be something somewhere to be like, oh, wait. We didn't file an official missing persons report, so we're not looking for her. However, Uh we know that somebody was reported or called in. Right. Different police departments. Right. But yes, 100%. It's ridiculous. Years and years and years went by with no word from Carol and no sign of her anywhere. So the family at first did believe that maybe she had just left and started a new life. And I'm sure a lot of that, too, was like wishful thinking, like they're hoping that she's alive. She had always talked about wanting to leave when she graduated high school. And so they thought, well, maybe she did. Although, and it's very odd of her to just up and leave like that. That wasn't like the type of person that she was, but they're thinking, well, maybe she did. And maybe one day she'll come home. She'll contact us. Yeah. I mean, because I was going to say that my oldest basically is like, I can't wait to move out when I'm 18. Mm-hmm. But I really hope that he's just like, bye, I'm moving out. <laughs> not. Yeah. Right. Not just disappears. Well, and the and- circumstances of her, of her leaving, it's like she went to a club and then decided that night to just never come home. Right. Exactly. She was out with her friends celebrating. Didn't seem right. like it was something. And so why the police didn't do a report is ridiculous. Yeah, right. Like that doesn't even make sense, mm-hmm. but they did it. And she never did contact them or come home. Mm -hmm. Now, get this, okay? In 2007, Mm -hmm. 26 years of not hearing from Carol, her sister, Sandra, decided that she was going to file a missing persons report. She was like, look, at this point, I don't care if she wants to be found or not. I want somebody to be looking for her. Okay. Like if she has been missing for 26 years and she also wanted because of this whole, you know, these new programs, unsolved crimes and missing persons, mm-hmm. things that are in place, which I'm going to talk about actually. She thought, well, maybe there will be a sign of her somewhere mm-hmm, mm-hmm, along mm-hmm. the way. So she wanted to have something official on file, even though it was 26 years later. So this time the police did take the report and it went into their system. In 2008, the Texas Rangers Unsolved Crimes Investigation Program was looking into unsolved murders of John and Jane Doe's, and they began looking into the young Hispanic Jane Doe found shot on the side of the road in 1981. Mm. They searched missing persons report from that time frame and came across Carol's that had just been filed a year before that. Right. Mm -hmm. Carol matched the age and the description of this Jane Doe. So in 2009, they contacted Carol's family and brought them in. After viewing autopsy photos of this Jane Doe, they positively identified her as Carol de Leon. And that was later confirmed by DNA testing. Wow. 28 years later, Carol's family were finally able to lay her to rest. Wow. Wow. However, they were heartbroken because at the same time, they had also just learned that Carol had been dead all of those years, that she was murdered, and that they had no idea who had killed her or why. Right. They lost all this time. I mean, the investigation, like, because clearly they just dropped the ball, the police. And and also, Mm -hmm. where was she? She was probably buried in some anonymous grave. She was buried in the town that she was found, that new Bron- Bronfels or whatever. Okay. As a Jane Doe, though. Right, yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. So this Unsolved Crimes Investigation Program was on the case now, and they fully intended on keeping the ball rolling and solving Carol's murder. I freaking love Texas. I love Texas. <laughs> Say it all the time. I love it. In 2010, the fingernail scrapings taken from Carol's body were sent in for DNA testing. 
Forensic specialists were able to create a full DNA profile. However, the profile did not match anyone in CODIS. So Carol's case went cold again. So this person didn't murder again? Apparently. Well, or they weren't caught if they did. That's true. In 2019, a new program circled back to it. This program is called the Texas Sexual Assault Kit Initiative and is funded by the Department of Justice. Another sample of DNA was collected and tested from Carol's body. It does not say specifically what that sample was, but I'm thinking that it had something to do with a sexual assault kit because mm-hmm. that's the name of the program. Mm-hmm. Right. So that DNA profile that was that they took the second one also matched this DNA profile from the fingernail scrapings. So they knew 100% whoever killed her, This we have their DNA. Mm-hmm. So they sent that DNA profile to genealogy for testing. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yes. That took a couple of years, but in 2021, the genealogy results came back and had identified profiles for three possible persons of interest. Okay. So they traced it back to three men that could have possibly been matched to the DNA. All three of these men were questioned and claimed to have never met or seen Carol and that they had nothing to do with her murder, but they all voluntarily gave DNA samples. In April of 2023. Whoa. So like like yesterday. Yesterday. (laughs) Yesterday, my dude. The results from the samples taken from those three men came back and they got a match to the DNA profile found on Carol's body and under her fingernails. The profile matched a 68-year-old man named Larry Allen West. Larry lived in Texas and he would have been 28 at the time of Carol's murder. So when police originally questioned him and he gave them their DNA sample, he told them that back in 1981, he often went to bars in and around San Antonio to meet and pick up young Hispanic women. So he was already on investigators' radar as being Carol's murderer. He's like, yeah, I probably picked her up and had sex with her. Well, no, he said that he didn't ever meet her and that he had nothing to do with her, but But, you know, he just happened to hang around in that area looking for people that were exactly Mm -hmm. like her. So there is a 1 in 422.1 quintillion chance that the DNA belongs to anyone other than Larry. Hmm. So on April 13th of 2023, yesterday, Larry West was arrested at his home in Converse, Texas, and charged with the first-degree murder of Carol DeLeon. 42 years after her murder. That's so That's crazy. Crazy, how, right? I mean, we've done a couple of these recently where it's like 50 years, whatever, lots of years later. And just because things were done so well and preserved, they're able mm-hmm. to figure it out. It's so crazy. It's amazing. So investigators spoke with Larry's ex-wives. Apparently there were several. Mm-hmm. And they all describe Larry as being a very violent person. Larry's first wife was only married to him for 30 days and said that during that time he repeatedly assaulted and raped her. Okay, this is concerning. Larry's bond was set at $125,000, and the day after he was arrested, he bailed out of jail. So he's out awaiting trial on house arrest, which is very upsetting to me. So I'll definitely keep you updated as his legal journey moves forward. Obviously, he's innocent until proven guilty, and his involvement at this time is just alleged. But I can't say he's one creepy-looking dude. I'll I'll post a picture. It, uh, alleged, except his DNA his was found on her dead there. body. It's, it's right. there. Like, well, I'm sure he's going to say, yeah, I had sex with her, but I didn't have anything to do with murdering her. Right. Yeah. I'm not I'm assuming that's going to be his story. Mm-hmm. So, obviously I hate that Carol was so brutally murdered and that she went without a name for mm-hmm. such a long time for so many years, but this case is fantastic in that it really shows how far we've come mm-hmm. in crime. Like it makes me hopeful because if you think we've gone from 
1981, not even taking a missing persons report to now 2023, having all these programs and units and genealogy specialists and all this stuff that work relentlessly Mm -hmm. to try to solve these cases, even cases that have been cold for more than 40 years. Like they're not Mm -hmm. letting them go. And it gives me hope. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just be murdering people and not get caught. We're going to find you. Yeah. You mofos. Yeah. Also. Take you down. That's right. Especially Mm -hmm. Texas. Love Texas. Mm -hmm. They have all these programs that specialize in this stuff. And it's like just neat. It was neat to read about all these different programs. Because, and this is something I probably should know just because of our line of work here. But what made them back in the day take samples underneath fingernails and, you know, like if we didn't have DNA? Okay, but because I think they were hopeful that we would one day. I mean, there were things like you could test for somebody's blood type Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and match a blood type. And so there were reasons to take evidence like that. Mm -hmm. Also, in 1981, no, there wasn't DNA and we couldn't forensically like link people that way. But there was, there was word that something like that was going to become available. You know what I'm saying? Like Mm -hmm. they always, the science was there. The idea Mm -hmm. was there. They just didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the technology to actually do it, but like the logic of it was present. Right, right. Okay. I think. I don't know. I was zero years old in 1981, so I can't speak to (laughs) the culture of crime. Anyway, I love Texas. Be like Texas. Be like Target. Be like Texas. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We could keep a list of this stuff. So those are my cases for today. Rest in peace to Sydney and Carol, two very young ladies with bright futures that were stolen from them. Yes. Thanks, Amanda and my sister, for trusting us with their stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks for to you for hanging with me for the. Well, twofer. I'm just glad that you could get him in because there's definitely been times in the past where we're like, sorry, there's not enough information. We can't do an episode. You know, right? Yeah. But these two stories were so. Like, we had to tell them. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I'm glad that you did it the way you did and got it in. And yeah, I'm glad Texas is so great with how they investigate things that we can solve a murder Mm -hmm. 40-something years later. Yeah. Pickneyville did good, too. Oh, well, yes. Pickneyville is good. Yeah. Gosh, there's something else that I was – when you were telling that story, I was looking at where it was on a map and kept thinking there's another link to there. Like somebody, I thought maybe somebody I knew was from there. Pickneyville? But I don't think it is. I think it's too far south. But anyway, I'll have to figure that out. Anyways, yes, Pickneyville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Thank you so much for telling those stories. Also, Sarah DeLeon, that was the name of the. Oh, Sarah. Yes. Oh my gosh. In, where was she? Well, those two cases were, she was in Kansas City. Okay. And then the then remember when we crossed over and yes. Missouri for the second one. But right. Anyway, yeah. So yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for doing those two cases and letting us know how um the outcome I, I love when it's solved over I know. so long. I do. Um yeah. I hate that it happened, but I love that it's solved. And so And it is sad that like it really bothers me that she was a Jane Doe. For like such a long time. Because I just feel like it's like, guys, take Mm. the missing person's report. Well, yeah. Write it down. Just write it down somewhere. Even if it's not something that you're going to, yeah, put like start searching for this person or like treat seriously because they're of age and they can disappear if they want to. But at least there's a record and you can be like, oh, well, you know what? There was this missing girl Mm -hmm. or this person found. So maybe we should check it out because they could have had an answer. Maybe they wouldn't have figured out who did it. Right away. Right. But at least they would have known where she was. Well, yes. And I think that there's a bigger chance that they – because they could have gone to the club and been like, who was she with? Right. And somebody would have been like, Larry Allen West. She was with that guy. Right. Yeah. This creepy guy that picks up Hispanic women. Yeah. We know him. Right. We know him here. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Anyway. Well, thanks so much for doing that. Um, glad it was solved. Um, don't – also, in terms of um, 
Sydney, don't come on, sisters, just confront your sister and be like, don't sleep with my boyfriend. Yeah. Right. Also don't be affiliated with gangs. Right. At that too. Like, no, not, it's not cool. It's not cool. Gangs are not cool. Anyway. (laughs) Um, okay. Well, if you like what you hear, come find us on, um, Patreon. We have a Patreon and we give you a crime episode every month and then a closet chit chat. Yes. Episode every month. Getting ready to record a Patreon right now, yes, actually. We are. I'm very excited. Yeah. yeah. Um, and come find us on socials where you will find all pictures related to these cases that Beth will post. And let us know what you think. And just always remember, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closets. <laughs>